All right, we're back. So, stability. We want to study uh, one motion that you know I mentioned several times since the beginning, which is the spinning motion. So, we want to study the stability of spinning motion. And we see okay. Okay. So um, let's say that our spacecraft is doing this. It's angular velocity, and I'm gonna drop, you know, the unnecessary notation uh, of you know body with respect to ECI. It's the angular velocity in the body axis. It's some omega x i, and then we understand that this is the i of the body plus omega y bar, I'll tell you what these are in a second, plus omega y zero on the j, plus omega z on the k axis. So this is the angular velocity of my spacecraft in the body axis. And this one here, um, it's my nominal spin angular velocity. So in other words, my unperturbed motion will actually be, so the omega unperturbed would just be omega y bar, some constant j. So let's say that I put my satellite into a spin condition about just one of its body axes, and we can easily assume that that's a principal axis of inertia. So um, I would like to see uh, if, if this motion is stable. And what that means is that I perturb the motion and see what happens. So uh, this is the generic perturbed motion where basically this quantity, this quantity, and this quantity, the omega x, omega z, and omega y zero, I, just, I just added the zero because, because otherwise it will look too much like uh, omega y bar. But anyways, these three are perturbations of the nominal motion. So I don't want them, but they can happen for it can happen for any any reason. So these are my perturbations. Uh, on of this of the spin motion. Uh, and so what I'm going to assume is that uh, all those so basically omega x, omega y0, omega z, omega x dot, omega y0 dot, and omega z dot are very small with respect to the spin motion, the nominal unperturbed motion that I want, okay? This has to be an assumption because I want to linearize my equations. Uh, but it's still a perturbation. Okay, so uh, what do we do? Well, we start from the dynamics that we know, and uh, all your equations in your slides are presented as uh, the moment of inertia about the principal axis x times omega x dot plus j on the z axis minus j on the y axis, and then I have omega uh let's see i have omega y omega z correct me if i'm wrong uh, no torques assume no external torques i also do not memorize these equations so i may be making mistakes here uh but i believe here we have i want to say jx minus jz omega z omega x equals zero if you have your slides handy, you can check if these are correct. It should be. I think here we have J, uh, probably Y minus X, something like that. Omega X, Omega Y equals zero. So these are the three equations of motion of a rigid body projected on the principal axis of inertia. And I'm actually going to check them because I don't trust myself. 
uh, with memory. So let me see. When did we see this? We saw them yesterday, correct? Uh, okay, I'm almost there. Okay, j x omega x dot, z minus y, x minus z, y minus x. Perfect. Okay, so this will be the equations. I need to recover my camera, otherwise I don't know what I'm looking at. Okay. And now I'm going to substitute uh, the motion that I have, this angular velocity here, okay? So if I start substituting the angular velocity, what do I get? Well, let's, without writing too much stuff, look at this, omega y times omega z. Omega y times omega z, for example, Is going to look like what is omega y? Well, it was that omega y bar, the nominal spin plus the perturbation that I called y omega zero, and that multiplies uh, omega z. And so you break it down, and that's omega y bar omega z plus omega y zero times omega z. What do I retain? What I do not retain? This is second order, okay? because I said that they are much smaller than omega y bar. So the product of perturbations, I'm gonna neglect because they are second order. So following this reasoning, starting from these equations here, these three scalar equations, and uh, simplifying second order terms, you are left, well, let's, let's see. I can already tell you that some things are going away. Omega z and omega x is a product of two perturbations. So this term will go away. Here you will only retain uh, this part, and uh, here you're going to retain something that it looks like omega x omega y bar for the same logic that I have applied in this simplification here. So in other words, my equations will simplify into jx omega x dot plus jz minus jy omega y bar omega z equals zero, then I have jy omega y dot equals zero, and then I have jz omega z dot plus jy minus jx. Please let me know if I go out of the screen. Uh, omega x omega y bar equals zero. All right, so um, I can start studying stability. Why? Because now these are linear equations. Think about this. This system can be absolutely expressed as some x dot equals ax because, uh, well, the x dot would be the omegas with the dots, okay? And these terms are now linear because these are constants. The omega y bar is my nominal motion is, I don't know, 100 RPM, 10 RPM, whatever that is, uh, but they're constants. Uh, it is a constant. So I don't have no linearities anymore. In fact, I have linearized. Um, so I can study the stability of this system. Now, this equation is completely decoupled from the other ones. So what, what is this equation telling me? Well, this is telling me that jy is definitely non-zero in general. This is telling me that omega y is constant. And so from the stability perspective, this means that in particular, omega y bar plus its perturbation will remain constant, definitely not exploding. It is simple stability. Uh, I don't have a damping component in that equation. In other words, uh, if I perturb omega y adding this term, omega y zero, it will never go away. It will remain uh, constant. So I add a, an additional spin or I remove some spin, depending on the sign of this omega y zero, and, and I keep it and it just uh, stays as it is. So if this was 10 RPM and I subtract one, it will stay at nine. It will not go lower, it will not grow, it will stay at nine. So. Simple stability right there. 
and that's a good thing. Okay. Uh, why is this spin stability important? Because because we put satellite in that condition to uh, to to maintain a pointing uh, in a certain direction in space that we want, uh, and so we want to know if if this is stable. Uh, and under which conditions is stable. So the, the y-axis seems to be okay. What about the other two? Well, uh, now I'm going to define x, since I want to write things in this form, I'm going to write that x is the vector composed of omega x and omega z, okay? And so my equations, the two of interest, that I need to study because now they are coupled. I can't just deal with them separately. Are these ones, and of course it's not going to fit in here. Equals zero, and then I have J Z omega Z dot plus J Y minus J X omega X omega Y bar equals zero. I want to put them in this form, uh, and that's pretty easy to do. So, what is this A in particular? Well, A is the following matrix. Zero, JY minus JZ over JX that multiplies omega Y bar. And then I have JX minus jy over jz that multiplies omega y bar zero that's my a okay you can show it to yourself if you define uh the state vector as omega x omega y like we did here these equations can be expressed in this form x dot equals ax where the a is this matrix so now, what can I say about the X and Y motion in terms of stability? What do I need to do? It's a linear system, linear time invariant system. We just said that in the slide. I look at the eigenvalues. What are the eigenvalues of these? Well, you compute the determinant, you do your, your operations, and you find that the eigenvalues are plus minus omega Y bar square root of JY minus JZ, JX minus JY over JX, JZ. So you start getting the feeling that really the stability boils down to moments of inertia about the principal axis. Um, it's going to boil down to how the mass is distributed. So you can't, as you can probably guess, can't pick any uh, axis to put your satellite into spin. So, um, okay. What can I do with these eigenvalues? Can I have plus? No, because if I have a plus eigenvalue positive, it's real because this is a real value and everything in here, you know, uh, if, it's, if it's real, if the square root of that quantity is real, it's going to give me a positive eigenvalue, and that's unstable. So it seems like uh, I am forced to study the only the cases where this is actually a complex value, complex number. And that means that whatever is uh, in the square root has to be negative. Otherwise, if it's not, I have a square root of a positive value. It gives me a positive value, and I have this plus and minus, and in particular the plus is the concern. It gives me a positive eigenvalue and that's unstable. So whatever it's in here has to be negative. And that means that basically JY minus JZ times JX minus JY has to be negative. And so you have two cases. Case one is that JY is greater than JZ. And at the same time, JY is greater than JX. Case two, JY is less than JZ, and it's also less than JX. 
okay. Well, what that means is that um, I have two choices. Remember, y is my axis of spin. And this is without loss of generality, okay? So I could have picked axis x or z, it doesn't matter. Um, so my spin axis, which is y, has to be either what? The axis of maximum inertia. So this is max inertia. Because, well, because the moment of inertia about the y-axis is greater than the other two. And I'm in principal axis, so I only care about moments of inertia and no products. Or the minimum axis of inertia. So the spin is stable. And this is simple stability again. Only about mean or max axis of inertia. And again, this means that those perturbations, you will keep them, but uh, they will not grow. There's no damping. Uh, the spin motion is, is, is stable only if you put your side into spin about either maximum or minimum axis of inertia. If you go with the intermediate axis of inertia, so you will have three different values in general. If you pick the one that is in, in the middle, it's not going to be stable. So your satellite will not stay spinning about that axis. It will do something else and it will try to spin about one of these other two. Make sense? Sorry, why is it uh, just simply stable? I'm sorry? Why is it just simply stable, simple stability, and not asymptotic stability? Because I don't have uh, a negative real part in my uh, eigenvalues. So, um, first of oh, all... Okay, they are imaginary. Okay, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I have no choice. So, if I go back to... Well, first of all, the second equation, we already know that is simple, that I have simple stability. So, the second equation is just telling me that Omega y remains constant. Um, that's the solution to this equation. Uh, and so just the, the, the second axis is already simply stable. So I can say that the entire attitude motion is simply stable just because of that one. But uh, when I look at the other two axes, uh, I, since these are the eigenvalues, I have no choice than only accepting uh, complex values. So, yep. Uh, let me see. I think I had something on the slides that I want to show you. Let me see if I can find it now. Okay. So, um, let me share one slide real quick and then I'll go back here. So, forget about everything else. Just look at this ellipsoid here. Um, what would happen if, for example, say that your uh, spin axis is your intermediate axis, this omega three, you think you can spin about this axis. So you start, uh, your angular velocity is, is perturbed to this point that is called IC. Your angular velocity vector will start doing something like this. It will start, you know, changing, pointing in space until it eventually, start pointing to the correct one, which in this case is one of the two, the maximum or minimum axis of inertia. So uh, visualizing what's actually happening to the motion of the spacecraft is not that simple, but definitely uh, you start spinning about one axis that is not the right one, and uh, it, will, it, will, it will not go well. You will start, you will, you will change motion completely. Your angular velocity will start pointing somewhere else. Now, um, there is a note to make. What I told you is partially a lie because um, in the 50s, there was a satellite called Explorer 1. I think it's it's uh, the first, uh, you, can, you can Google it, Explorer 1. Um, it's a very elongated, satellite looks almost like a little rocket and so um with antennas etc 
and uh, well, the, the engineers uh, decided that they needed to be spin stabilized about the long axis, which, as you can imagine, it's the minimum axis of inertia. So they gave it a spin about this axis. Um, and they were, they were terrified, horrified by the fact that this didn't work. It didn't stay there. Uh, it didn't uh, spin in a stable manner about that axis. It did something weird and eventually decided to spin about one of these other two, assuming that they have the same moment of inertia. But he ended up going into a spin about the maximum axis of inertia, actually. And that is because uh, what we've done is based not only on uh, linear equations, it's only based, it's also based on rigid body assumption. Uh, but reality is that nothing is perfectly rigid. And so there is always a little bit of dissipation of kinetic energy due to uh, flexible modes. And so if you can look at these slides, real spacecraft are quasi rigid bodies and some are really not rigid at all, especially when you start having you know, antennas and deployables. And so uh, they, they started revising what I just showed you. This was in the 50s, not too long ago, um, with this hypothesis that the structural frequencies of vibration are much higher than the characteristic frequency of the ro uh, rotational motion, and that's okay. Uh, but um, if you're quasi rigid, uh, you're still uh, dissipating a little bit of energy, rotational energy. Uh, the acting torque can be neglected, but basically they had to change the theory and came up with what is called the energy sink approximation, and K would be in this case the kinetic energy. Um, so they kind of massage the theory to explain why. Uh, this object wouldn't spin about the minimum axis of inertia. And so they came up with this rigid, quasi rigid body assumption, which again means what I just read to you that the structure of frequency of vibration are super high compared to whatever you're doing to control your spacecraft, but still they're there and, and they are killing slowly your kinetic energy. So if we assume that the angular momentum is constant, uh, so there are no torques from the outside. But the kinetic energy is now not constant and it goes down to zero. Well, then you are looking at something like this. And to stop sharing. So this is what's happening. Uh, our angular momentum vector, if I write it in, uh, in uh, body axis, it will basically look like three quantities, Jx omega x, Jy omega y, and Jz omega z, right? No brainer. Uh, the kinetic energy, uh, you probably know this from uh, Koenig's expansion, but uh, we can just say that twice the kinetic energy without demonstration is given by this. Jy omega y squared plus Jz omega z squared. It's, uh, it's, um, h dotted with omega uh, but yeah um so this is the rotational kinetic energy then of course there will be the translational one that has to do with the orbit but uh, we don't care about that in this little exercise so I'm, I'm, what i'm trying to do is show you that that uh sink energy sink approximation is forcing us to say okay i can only spin about the uh, axis of maximum inertia, which is really what, what happens. In real life, those two solutions that I gave you, uh, well, only one is, is, is true. The rigid body will want, or quasi-rigid body, will want to spin about the maximum axis of inertia, not the minimum one. And that's exactly what they observed. So I'm going to assume that this is constant, OK? And we said that this one instead is decreasing. Okay, now I have a spinning object, case one is, well, it's spinning about the maximum inertia. So let's say that uh, the y-axis is, uh, y is the maximum inertia. Okay, uh, 
if I'm spinning about that axis, my kinetic energy, I can simplify it using just that term is uh, it's y max omega y about that max axis squared. Um, then I have second case. I spin about the minimum axis of inertia. So 2k, uh, I should have put a max here as well. 2k min um, y, j y min and omega y min squared. And I'm looking at the same motion, okay? So I want to see if my spacecraft given these assumptions that h is the same and it's constant this is not going to change and that the kinetic energy has to decrease if it's going to prefer one of the two solutions here okay well uh, if h is constant and it's the same the norm of the angular momentum which i decided that needs to stay constant again these are assumptions that we made well it will be j y max omega y max, but also j y min uh, omega y min. It's the same motion, okay? It's just that I want to see if I put it spinning about the minimum inertia axis, is it going to want to go to the max or vice versa? Okay, from this assumption that h is constant and it can be expressed in these two different ways, uh, you can solve that omega y max, for example, is equal to j1 min j y max omega y min okay well uh, if h is the same and k has to go down what what do you think um, is the solution Solution is, if I have this one expressed as the y max, uh, omega y max, and I look at the expressions for the kinetic energy that I gave you in the two, two cases, well, the solution is that k, the kinetic energy about, or with a two in front because that's what we wrote, about the minimum inertia axis is greater than the kinetic energy about the maximum inertia, inertia axis. So the spacecraft will want to go here uh, with the assumption that there is dissipation of kinetic energy. So the only spin stable axis is the max moment of inertia axis. Make sense? Now, uh, what I thought the first time I saw this uh, was that, wow, what a bunch of assumptions just to make it work. Uh, and, and, and it is actually true. But, you know, uh, imagine being a NASA engineer in the 50s, at the end of the 50s, and seeing that your spacecraft is doing something completely different uh, than what it was supposed to do. Uh, it must have been a heck of a of an experience for them. Uh, so now, another thing to know is that, uh, uh, so we're not done with notes before I show you the slides again. Um, usually, Sorry. so uh, yes. just some, So now this is asymptotically stable. In this case, I would say yes. Um, okay. So we throw away, uh, of course, I haven't written anything that you know looks at eigenvalues or studies stability in any other way. But uh, basically, yes. In this case, if you put it to spin about uh, one axis, that is either the intermediate one or the um, minimum one, it will want to go to the maximum one, and so it's definitely returning there. Yes. Okay. So and the the so the maximum one is like the good one because uh, it. Uh, uh, minimizes the energy while keeping uh, the um, the Each momentum, one. right? Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. Very very. Cool.
So in other words, it's uh, what they what they did. You can see it this way: is that they said, okay, the rigid body dynamics assumption that we use to derive all this stability uh, is kind of garbage. Is not super good. Uh, so we're gonna call it quasi rigid. So they didn't abandon entirely uh, Euler's equations, um, but they added uh, a, a little bit of. Uh, a modification to to them by assuming that h can be kept constant, but the kinetic energy is going down. Um, so they were not really looking at modeling the spacecraft with the natural modes of vibration and adding those modes into the equations of motion. Uh, but um, you know they, they found the shortcut, and it, it is true. It is true that the kinetic energy is dissipated. Uh, the rotational kinetic energy is dissipated because of uh, of um, uh, vibrational modes. Um, yeah, so interesting, right? So uh, since we're talking about uh, spin stability, just to uh, be a little more complete in the analysis and uh, and consistent uh, with what people do when they study spin stability, uh, there are a couple of quantities that are defined and a plane in which the stability is studied. So. Uh, there's, this is not kinetic energy, it's just a constant. It's called Kx. It will be the ratio of Jy minus Jz divided by Jx. Uh, and then there is a Kz, which is Jy minus Jx divided by Jz. So you can prove to yourself that these are the Kx and Ky, I'm sorry, Kz are both between 1 and minus 1. And... Uh, <clears throat> and so when we study spin stability, what you see often in textbooks is uh, the plane K, X, K, Y. And as you build your spacecraft and you compute your moments of inertia, you look at where you are in this plane, right? So um, this is the line where K, oops, terrible line, but this is the line where K, X, and K, Y are the same, and K, Z. Ah. Sorry, this is KZ. Okay, uh, this is the line where they are the the same. Yes, KX equal to KZ. Uh, if they are the same, um, then you you know you have different regions: region one, region two, region three, region four. Uh, So the stable areas, given all that we said, you can show that they're going to be, I think I have it in the slides, much better image. Uh, let me show you that. Okay. So uh, this line here, where Kx and Kz are the same, is also satisfying the condition that Jx and Jz are the same. And so these are the stable areas uh, where JY is greater than the other ones. So it's the maximum moment of inertia. These are the regions unstable. And so you will see uh, you will see plots like this um, when you talk about spin stability. And now this plane can be modified, as we will see, to to gain uh, some other regions uh, by doing different things to the spacecraft. No time to talk about them. Um, okay, Explorer 1. This is taken from Wikipedia. Uh, you're more than welcome to read it, but you know, this, this satellite was an elongated body. They, it, need, it was supposed to spin about the long axis and uh, it never did uh, because, because of, you know, uh, of 200 years of Eulerian, Eulerian theory that was, you know, supposed to uh, to be modified. These are some nice pictures of uh, the gentleman who uh, designed Explorer 1. This is how it actually looks like. Um, and, uh, well, you know, it's never to learn too late to, to change theory and learn something new, I guess. That was the point of what happened. Okay, uh, continuing on with these slides, 
Uh, talking about spin stabilization and a few more facts. Um, it, it is used for communication spacecraft. Usually the RPMs that you're looking at are between 1 and 30. Uh, you spin about the maximum axis of inertia, which is aligned with the axis normal to the orbital plane. Uh, usually, in order to maintain that axis inertially fixed. Um, so, yeah, what would be really one application of spinning is that you, you put the spin axis aligned with some inertial direction that you want to maintain. That's really the bottom line of, of spinning uh, an object about one axis. Uh, it may be used during orbit transfer. Um, say that you're, you know, you're firing an engine. Well, spinning about the axis of the engine, uh, it's a way to try to counteract the effect of asymmetry of the thrust. Um, so it's it's a way to uh, to keep the pointing uh, as a, you know a little more accurate. And so here you're talking about higher rates, uh, up to 100 rpm. And then it's been used on uh, probes like Voyagers, Pioneers, Cassini. Uh, they're spin stabilized, and the axis of spin is actually uh, kept, was kept towards the Earth for communication purposes. So imagine that the antenna is mounted on that axis that you're spinning uh, so that it can uh, look at uh, an inertially fixed point, which would be the, the Earth far away, uh, more or less at all times, and you're talking about again uh, a few RPMs, no more than that. Okay. Uh, more elaborate ways, dual spinners. Uh, now, what if I don't have the luxury of spinning the entire object? Because I have other systems, sensors, you name it, uh, that I really don't want to spin all the time. Well, then you spin only a piece of the satellite. Um, they're not used that much anymore. Now we have, you know, momentum wheels inside the space car. But uh, an example is is this one, uh, the Dandy Dragon Atmospheric Neutral Density Explorer. A piece of the space car is spinning, and other parts are not, uh, because there are apertures that have to measure wind and temperature. Uh, there is a spectrometer. The space car is flying in this direction that is indicated by the vector space car velocity. And so only a part of it is actually spinning. Um, you know, other concepts, uh, this could be one. Uh, you spin a section of the spacecraft. On that axis, you have an antenna that is pointing down. It's not spinning. Uh, the direction of motion is, is the direction of spin as well. And so it will give this antenna some somewhat a somewhat stable uh, motion looking down. Um, and you can point it to Earth. Now, when you have a dual spinner without showing it, the uh, the KX and the KZ, um, they will become, you know, they will have an effect that, that, that makes the stability region grow a little bit. So, if this uh, uh, Area was the first quadrant was the one when we had uh, where we had stability for a, just a sing, single rigid body spinning about the maximum axis of inertia. Well, when you have a dual spinner uh, along still the y axis, the maximum axis of inertia, well, you can actually push it and go on the minimum axis of inertia and gain a little bit of uh, of stability in these regions that otherwise, with a single object spinning, you wouldn't be able to uh, to access. So that's, you know, that's why we, we modify these rigid bodies and add things to them. Uh, there are other examples here. Uh, this one on top that you see on top uh, was launched in 69. Uh, was the first dual spinner uh, developed by Boeing. And then there is another one by Boeing as well here. And, and these two spacecraft uh, really resemble, going back a couple of slides, this scenario here where you have uh, a part of the body spinning, but the part with the antenna is not. And here you see the clear separation between the two. Um, currently, what we do is that we replace them with wheels inside the spacecraft. The concept is the same. Um, the concept is exactly the same. You spin something, uh, and, uh, and the reason is to keep that axis as stable as possible. 
and we call them gyrostats uh, because it's you know the technology has uh, advanced and it's much easier and more practical to have maybe something a little bit smaller but spinning much faster inside than um, than actually spinning the entire external part of the spacecraft. So in this in this image, you see that you have uh, you know this satellite with the momentum wheel inside that is spinning. Uh, the Earth is this uh, yo is, is down here somewhere to the left. That's the yo axis. You're flying in the direction of the roll axis, of course, and the other direction is normal to the orbital plane. And so you spin the wheel, as we said before in a couple of slides uh, before. You spin that wheel in a direction that is the same as the orbital plane normal, and you're giving all these objects, the solar panels and especially the antenna. A somewhat stable, you know, motion. They will kind of face the Earth at all times, uh, unless the perturbation um, um, is, you know, it's it's substantial, and then you know you can still move it away. But the concept is the same as the bicycle wheel. Again, uh, if you spin your bicycle wheel fast, uh, it's going to be more difficult to change the direction of its spin axis. That's really the bottom line, uh, and. Uh, well, what else do we find? Well, gravity gradient is maybe topic for tomorrow. But to wrap this up today, um, you know, if you have spinning stabilized spacecraft, what do you do if you actually want a little more uh, asymptotic stability? I mean, we said that there is asymptotic stability, but we can't really rely on that quasi rigid hypothesis or, well, I mean, reality to eventually converge to the nominal motion because it may take a very long time. And that's you know something that is somewhat outside of our control. And so we use what are called nutation dampers for spinning stabilized spacecraft. So uh, they try to uh, to bring you back uh, to to the actual uh, nominal motion a little bit faster than just the dissipation because of vibrational modes. Um, so they used to dump out any nutation after the disturbance to realign the angular momentum, the axis of maximum inertia, and the angular velocity, which is the ideal motion that we want to keep. Um, and so when you have nutation, by the way, there is also precession. And so you want to dissipate uh, the kinetic energy. That's really what you want to do to bring back motion to the nominal one. And you can find viscous rings. They are ring-shaped uh, tubes with mercury inside of them. Uh, or you have, you know, tubes with little balls inside of them, basically. Uh, and so the friction between uh, inside the, the tube and also impacts of these balls inside the tube, it dissipates mechanical energy. There are pendulum dampers. Uh, you know, there are def different solutions out there that you really have not for us to explore in this class, but uh, there are ways to, to bring back the motion and, and create some somewhat asymptotical stability uh, when you have a, a spinner, either a sing, single spinner or dual spinner or a momentum biased system. Uh, so I think it's enough on spinning. Um, any questions on this topic? So the next one uh, that I was going to explore, but definitely we can start today and finish tomorrow, is uh, is gravity gradient. So this is another type of force that is kind of either there for free or we try to exploit it. Um, and it's due to the mass distribution again. To, uh, so it, it will go back to moments of inertia uh, like, like we've seen for spinning. Um, but it's exploiting the fact that um, you know, there is more attraction towards um, towards the planet for parts that are closer to the planet. No questions. Okay. So I'll start it, and then uh, we'll definitely continue tomorrow. Second chunk of lectures. The first two hours, as we said, we will look at the homework and the function that does the orbital mechanics and the desired quaternion. All right, so now um, let's go back to an actual orbit. So we have, we're going to talk about gravity gradient.
Okay, so we have our planet here, ECI. I'm gonna draw just a piece of the of the orbit. Let's say that we're flying this way. Uh, and then uh, the LVLH, like we've seen before, A3 this way, A2 will be opposite to the angular momentum, and A1 is the cross product of the two. Okay. And I'm going to call this the, I'm just going to call this A, and this is N. Okay. Uh, what else do we have? Uh, well, this is, of course, is the radius. I'm not going to draw the radius because it will be a little too much. Um, okay. Um, let's say that this is a circular orbit. You know, gravity gradient is especially used in low Earth orbits that are, for the most part, circular. The angular velocity of A with respect to N, as we have seen also in the software today, is some minus magnitude N um, A2. And this uh, N is square root of mu over R cubed is another way to compute the angular velocity on a circular orbit. So the spacecraft now uh, has completely different axis. So um, maybe I can use a different color on the same sketch and hopefully it will not be too messy. Uh, OK, we have five minutes left. Teams is telling me that. So let's say that this is the axis B1, body axis 1. Um, body axis 2 is pointing somewhere else. I have no hope that this is going to look like a right-handed orthonormal basis, okay? But it is. So these are the body axis, and then this is the center of mass of the spacecraft, by the way. Spacecraft COM. Okay. So I'm going to work first uh, towards representing the motion of this spacecraft with respect to LVLH, and then this will allow me to... Uh, you know, talk about gravity gradient. So, um, all right, the spacecraft angular velocity with respect to n is this, okay? Uh, not this, I'm sorry, this was the uh, orbital angular velocity. So the uh, spacecraft angular velocity of the body with respect to n, well, I can break it down into um, into the angular velocity of A with respect to B plus the angular velocity of, uh, what am I doing here? I'm sorry, B with respect to A, sorry about that. And then I have uh, A with respect to N, right? Chain rule. Uh, okay, so this is omega, body with respect to LVLH, basically. And then, uh, well, A with respect to N, we had it, was minus NA2. Okay. We also know that we can write the body axis These are all tools that we have seen together. Uh, via the following transformation. I have a DCM matrix here, C11, C12, etc., 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 times A1, A2, and A3. You know, that's one of the uses of the DCM. And I'm going to call this uh, CBA. It goes from A to B. I also know that uh, uh, C, A, B, if I ever need to invert it, it's equal to the transpose of these. It's one of the properties of rotation matrices, right? Okay. And so if I have C11, C12, C22, etc., 
the transpose of that will have these elements as columns, so all the rows become columns, etc. And uh, and so I can write the opposite of what I just wrote, and I'm going to stop with this, a1, a2, a3. It's going to be the transpose of that matrix, so now I'm going to have c12, c1, c11, c12, c13, etc., etc., that multiplies b1, b2, b3. And I'm going to stop here because it's time, um, and we'll uh, continue from there. Remember, this is the introduction to gravity gradient, so i just just setting up what we need uh, to show uh, the equations for gravity gradient. Okay. I think you had enough today. No? Is this still interesting? Sent you an email for feedback. Two of you have responded. They said, yeah, sure. This is good. Well, let me know if the pace topics or anything else is not looking good, and I'll try to adjust. So far, so good? Yes, yes. Sounds like a yes. Yes. OK. Hey, if I am doing things that you already know, you should tell me <laughs> as well. Um, all right, so we'll save these discussions for tomorrow. Uh, have a good rest of your evening, and I will see you tomorrow at your 11 a.m., I believe. Uh, and we'll, uh, the first two hours, we'll do simulink only, okay? Okay, thank you. Yes. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 B